Welcome to lecture one on the Constitution. In the beginning, our democratic experiment might well have failed. The original 13 colonies were independent and could have gone their separate ways. Differences between them based both on social and economic conditions, including slavery in the southern states, were obvious challenges to unity. Given these potential problems, how did democracy survive? The framers of the Constitution had significant experience to guide them. For nearly two centuries, Europeans have been sailing to the New World in search of liberty, especially religious liberty, as well as the chance to own land and to, and to an extent, exercise self-governance in colonial legislatures. The experience of settling a new land, overcoming obstacles, and enjoying the fruits of their labors was also important to the spirit of independence in the colonies. But freedom, ultimately, in the colonies was limited. Ironically, given their concern for religious liberty, the Puritans in Massachusetts established a theocracy, a system of government in which religious leaders claimed divine guidance and in which other sects were denied religious liberty. Later, as that system was challenged, the Puritans continued to worry about what would maintain order in a society lacking an established church and attachment to place and the uncontested leadership of men of merit. Nine of the 13 colonies would eventually set up a state church. Throughout the 1700s, Puritans in Massachusetts barred certain men from voting on the basis of their church membership. Women, slaves, and Native Americans, however, could not vote at all. By the 1700s, editors in the colonies found that, for the most part, they could speak freely in their newspapers. Dissenters could distribute leaflets, and agitators could protest in taverns or in the streets. Yet dissenters were occasionally exiled, imprisoned, and some were even executed. Some printers were also beaten and had their shops closed. In short, the colonists struggled to balance stability and dissent, order and liberty. The framers of the U.S. Constitution spelled out the purpose of government in the Constitution's preamble. They wanted to promote justice, to maintain peace at home, to defend the nation from foreign foes, to provide for the welfare of the citizenry, and last, to, de to secure the blessings of liberty. Now, during the first half of the 1700s, the British ruled the American colonies with an exceedingly light hand. Now, this relationship ultimately changed when the British government accumulated a massive debt during the French and Indian War. The British had to provide continuing protection to the colonies. In essence, someone had to pay for all these bills. So, Britain sought to impose new, modest commerce taxes on the colonists. These included the Sugar Act of 1764, which taxed molasses, sugar, and other commodities, and later, the Stamp Act of 1765, which required printed materials to have a stamp on them. Before the new taxes, merchants and wealthy planters were essentially content with British colonial rule. But the new taxes came at a high cost to their bottom lines or their wealth. The new taxes led to a coalition of differing interests. Merchants and planters joined together with the lower classes and they organized protest. It was unified in then a boycott of British goods that essentially forced the crown to rescind the new taxes. Disagreements between the British and the colonists over taxation continued. In 1773, the British government took action with the Tea Act. It granted the East India Trade Company a monopoly on imported tea. The colonists, angered, led by Samuel Adams, responded in protest. They disguised themselves as Mohawk Native Americans. They boarded three British ships and threw the entire cargo of tea into the Boston Harbor. Later, due to uh, overreaction by the British uh, government over the Boston Tea Party, which essentially closed the uh, port of Boston and 
placed a lot of restrictions on the government of Massachusetts. We're not going to get into a whole uh, recital of the events that led up to the um, Revolutionary War, but we will cover the, um, the Declaration of Independence. In 1776, the Second Continental Congress appointed a committee to draft a statement of independence. Now, this committee included Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, Roger Sherman of Connecticut, John Adams of Massachusetts, and Robert Livingston of New York. The Declaration of Independence essentially is made up of two parts. The first part is a philosophical document. It was heavily influenced by the views of John Locke. Now, the Declaration of Independence proclaimed in ringing tones, quote, that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that to secure those rights, governments are instituted among men, and that whenever a government becomes destructive of those ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it. We have heard these ideas a great many times, and we often take them for granted. Revolutionary leaders did not. They were willing to fight, pledge their lives, fortunes, and sacred honor for these rights. Indeed, by signing the Declaration of Independence, they were effectively signing their own death warrants if the revolution failed. Now, the second half of the document was essentially a political document. It focused on grievances, goals, and principles, essentially to unite the various groups in the colonies and forge some type of national unity. So if we ask ourselves, if signing the Declaration of Independence was such a uh, risky tactic, what happened to the men who signed it? Well, five of the signers were captured by the British as traitors, and they were tortured before they died. Twelve of them had their homes ransacked and burned. Two lost their sons serving in the Revolutionary Army. One had two sons captured. Nine of the 56 fought and died from wounds or hardships during the Revolutionary War. Some specifics, Carter Braxton of Virginia, a wealthy planter and trader, saw his ships swept from the seas by the British Navy. He sold his home and properties to pay his debts and died poor. Tom McKinn was so hounded by the British that he was forced to move his family almost constantly. He served in Congress without pay and his family was kept in hiding. His possessions were taken from him, and poverty was his reward. Bandals of soldiers looted the properties of Dillery, Hall, Clymer, Walkin, Gwinnett, Hayward, Rutledge, and Middleton. At the Battle of Yorktown, Thomas Nelson Jr. noted that the British General Cornwallis had taken over the Nelson home for his headquarters. He quietly urged General George Washington to open fire. The home was destroyed, and Nelson later died bankrupt. Francis Lewis had his home and properties destroyed. The enemy jailed his wife, and she died within a few months. John Hart was driven from his wife's bedside as she lay dying. Their 13 children fled for their lives. His field and his grist mill were laid to waste. For more than a year, he lived in forest and caves, returning home to find his wife dead and his children gone. A few weeks later, he died from exhaustion and a broken heart. And... Two other gentlemen, Norris and Livingston, suffered similar fakes. Moving on, let's talk about the Articles of Confederation. As the war against the British widened to include 13 colonies, the need for arose for a stronger government to unite them. In 1777, Congress established a new national government, the Confederation under a written document called the Articles of Confederation. Now, this was the first written constitution of the United States. The articles were not approved by all state legislatures until 1781, after Washington's troops had been fighting the British for about six years. The Confederation was more of a fragile league of friendship than it was a national government. The state governments retained their sovereignty, freedom, and independence, making them a confederation. Now let's talk about some of the characteristics of the new constitution. In it, there was no national executive, no president, 
well, there was a president, but it was merely a ceremonial position. Uh, no judiciary and no national currency. Congress had no direct authority over the nation. They had to work through the states. They could not levy taxes, or Congress could not tr regulate trade between the states or with other nations. Neither could it prevent states from taxing each other's goods or issuing their own currencies. The lack of a judicial system meant that the national government had to rely on state courts to enforce national laws and to settle disputes between the states. In practice, state governments could overturn national laws. It was essentially an impractical government. Each state had one vote regardless of population. All 13 states had to agree to make amendments and it also lacked any kind of national army as the armed forces at the moment that were fighting the Revolutionary War were essentially state militias and they operated under their authority. We're going to end lecture one on that note. Thank you.